Okay. Hi, everyone. I believe the camera's on and we are, we have a really full house. So thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Joseph Underwood. I'm the assistant professor for African art history at Kent State University. And I'm also the co-curator of Textures, the History and Art of Black Hair, an exhibition that is up at the Kent State University Museum and runs through August 2022. We are really excited about the spate of programming we have this year, featuring so many different artists and scholars and thinkers around the important subject of Black hair, Black visual culture, and history. So uh, for today's event, I'm very excited to welcome our panelists. Um, Nonsi Kalela Mutiti, also will be referred to as Nonsi in this um, conversation, is a, a fabulous uh, Zimbabwe-born visual artist and educator. She is invested in elevating the work and practices of Black people's past, present, and future through a conceptual approach to design, experimental publishing, and archiving practices, and peer-to-peer -peer collaborations. Mutiti holds a diploma in multimedia art from the Zimbabwe Institute of Digital Arts and an MFA from the Yale School of Art with a concentration in graphic design. Some of her most recent accomplishments include the Soros Arts Fellowship for Art Migration in Public Space and being selected for the DAD, D-A-A-D, Artists in Berlin program, where she is currently and joining us virtually. <laughs> Our other panelist for today is Kijo Lee. Kijo is an art historian and curator who is director of academic affairs and associate curator of special projects at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Her expertise is in American art history, the history of photography and African-American studies, as well as museum education. She earned her BA in art history at Douglas College and a dual MA in art history and African American studies from Yale University. She's currently a PhD candidate at Yale University where her dissertation is titled Precarious Matters, Photography, Physics, and Blackness. So um, a virtual welcome to my co-panelists. I will stop sharing. Fabulous to see you both today. Thank you for joining us. Um, so we're just going to dive in and have a conversation. There are slides and pictures and, and visual informatics that each of us have to share at different points, but I'm just really excited for a, a free flowing conversation on the themes that have been really prevalent um, in uh, Nonsi's work over the last few years. So as an introduction to the topic, Nonsi, how do you distinguish between the fields of art and design? Are these really different worlds? Um, do you exhibit or publish differently depending which field you are using? So just for, for those of us who aren't as versed in the difference between the two or how they might manifest in a practice, what is art versus design? Oh, you're, you're muted. I haven't done a Zoom talk in so long, so I'm forgetting about all the technical things. Um, but it's a pleasure to be here, first of all, and excuse my uh, slight croakiness. I had a little bit of a flu, but I'm really glad to be speaking with you all today. And, um, you know, the question that uh, David poses is one that, you know, often gets asked to me, many of my colleagues. And I've uh, gotten to a place where I think less about uh, these demarcations from um, an academic uh, perspective or kind of uh, how we have stereotypically thought about design as something that is um, organized for an end user and the, the artist who's working in that way is kind of producing something that has a really technical use value within a community and often a targeted community and, and, and that an artist is making work that is um, self-initiated and really out, um, out of their own motivations. I think as an artist, I'm making things that are functional um, for people and things that are also functional for myself and things that, that I feel are important uh, for me to say and for me to investigate. Um, but, but more than that, I've gotten to a place of really thinking about my background as a Zimbabwean woman and um, an African woman and thinking about where those demarcations are productive and where they totally fall apart. Um, you know, we, we're here because of the exhibition textures. We're thinking about um, the craft of black hair, how it is technical and it 
is um, something we need to do to groom ourselves, to keep ourselves healthy. It's something that we do because um, of thinking through aesthetics, but those aesthetics are markers. They communicate um, age, station, moments in time. I shaved my head when I'm going through something new. So transitioning to Berlin, I shaved my head, um, leaving New York. And then when I arrived, I, I shaved my head again. Um, and so I don't really see the, the clear split. I'll give another example um, that with clothing, we also think about this within the space of Africa. And I think many people as well, uh, but really, you know, in, in African cultures, you have this idea of presenting oneself, cultivating a, a presence, and that what you wear at different moments in your life um, and uh, are determined by who you are, where you're going, like what people group you belong to. It's, it's, it's significant, it's a signifier, but it is also beautiful, it's intentional. And it's also about what you have around you. Um, and so it's communicating, but it's also celebrating and it's also um, cultivating cultivating a sense of community. So for myself and my work, I, I like to think about um, not using those labels until they are functional. Um, and I present my work. You asked about, about a platform. I think that platform is only useful because of the audience that you can reach through that space. And so I present work that's made with design tools, but it goes into museums and galleries. And I also uh, design um, artwork that goes into publications or think about publication as an artwork, creating a publishing entity that is an art project. Um, and so I will use the terms when they kind of feel technically useful and, and become a mediator between me and people I'm having a conversation with. But I could totally talk about the work without, without those labels. Um, I still think it's relevant. The most important thing is that I'm working around beauty. I'm thinking about beauty and the functional aspects of beauty, that it can arrest us, it can hold us, it can um, heal us, it can communicate. And, and that's what I'm really interested in. And that's the part that, um, yeah, that's why I make what I make. I'm very interested in the functional aspects of beauty. I really love that, Nancy, because intellectually, I live in the both and, which is what you seem to be describing. and only use terms like, oh, I'm an expert in American art when it's useful to make myself legible in order to get into a place and do whatever the hell I want. So <laughs> which is one of the ways that I, I feel you um, uh, um, as well. And so, you know, we've known each other for quite a while. And I think that one of my favorite experience of, experiences of your work happened back in uh, 2014 during your residency at Recess um, in New York. And what struck me most really, and when you say um, that the hinge in your work is beauty, I also think that there is a kind of lightness and levity that you bring to, um, to this conversation that is so enmeshed in history and so laden, right, with, um, with either value or being devalued, um, as in, you know, Black women's hair. And so when um, I entered that space, which was at once familiar and challenging, so there were women braiding hair and learning how to braid hair, but also it was like a gallery space. So it was challenging to the structures of art history in which I'm supposed to enter into a space and be able to assess it immediately and make these decisions about it, but it also felt like home, um, which is not something that often happens to me in, a, in an art space. So I'm wondering, can you speak a bit about how that project came into being and how your practice has evolved? Because there are some elements, elements I still find familiar, but they are used quite differently. Yeah, um, I started um, the project Ruka um, in the background of my um, research during my thesis at Yale. And I, I think you remember coming to my desk during open studios, I used to have mannequins um, training heads for, for hairdressing school. Uh, at my desk, I was collecting combs at that time. I started collecting business cards because I was moving through uh, spaces like Harlem. Um, I was thinking about home, how, how Harlem reminded me so much about home or the African aunties on the street level and started to collect those things and bring them towards myself. Um, and also thought about the idea of myself as an African immigrant who is producing work that is about beauty, but is also can be in service of other people. 
when you think about a design practice that has a, a commercial kind of uh, bent to it um, for in terms of someone commissioning you. Um, and I just felt like, oh, I, the, the women in the salon are doing what I'm doing. We're all thinking about beauty. We're working for beauty. We're working for our community. And I was really struggling whilst in grad school to figure out how to do work with this that didn't feel performative. I didn't feel like um, I was going to put myself and my peers, black peers, on as kind of you know people to be you know become subjects and people coming around the work uh, as kind of curiosity. And so when I got the residency at recess, it was wonderful because it was on the street level where I found the braiders, not in Harlem, it was in Soho. And so when you say that you know it was a, a really wonderful experience, beautiful space. Thinking about an African hair braiding salon in a space like Soho is probably one of the most untidy things that someone walking down the street in Soho could imagine. But for people like us, you know, it called out to people, Black women coming off the street in Soho, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe there's a salon here. This is amazing. You know, just that surprise that I had when I was walking in Harlem and like, oh my God, these salons look exactly like the ones we have back at home. I can, I can be in the US and have what I need to be tended to. So it was really a project for myself. It was a project of trying to think, how can I be at home in New York? How can I make something where I can pull people towards my work and towards myself that can become kin? And it was really a moment for um, me to meet a lot of um, writers and curators, other artists. The, the work just brought so many people from the African diaspora, Caribbean artists, um, you know, other artists from Africa, Black American artists, Black British artists, all just around this activity of thinking about hair. Um, and I didn't do anyone's hair until the end of the project. I used that project to learn how to braid hair, to think about that um, kind of thing that I had lost with leaving home, leaving, um, being separate from my sisters and not being able to share and teach each other in those ways I kind of needed to produce. Um, I needed to make my colleagues into kin. And that's what that project was for. So a lot of the work I make is self-motivated. It's about filling gaps uh, that I have because of this process of um, immigration and trying to um, add this idea of home and also acknowledging that there's many other people that are going through this experience. So what does it mean to be in diaspora and how can we kind of um, use our work to, to make stronger connections and hold each other and really um, make the, this new host space a home space? That's beautiful, thank you. I love that idea of making colleagues into kin. And also taking the authority that artists have to say, no, this is self-motivated, which we'll talk about later is the way that I think that intellectual or scholarship should work as well to a certain extent. Yeah. I will add something briefly uh, that's just like technically related to my work process. At that moment I had to do, I had just finished grad school was doing some commercial projects to make ends meet mm -hmm. and was trying to figure out how my research could become something that could go out into the world and what the my resources looked like. And so the, the, the residency offered an opportunity to make work whilst people would come into the space and talk to you about the work. And I was able to have equipment, you know, space is a premium in New York City. So um, really being able to carry out research in the sight of people and have conversations and make things and share things and distribute things. It became like an opportunity for me to think again about pushing work out onto the street level mm -hmm. where I didn't have like a bookstore or a website to mediate the exchange uh, between the objects. I was, well, my, my ideas through uh, the mediation of the uh, kind of publications or posters and things that I was making or collecting to an audience member or a friend um, or a new colleague. It was really, that space really allowed me to understand how I could circumvent certain formal channels and use them, um, whether it is to distribute my art or distribute um, things that seem to be dis, um, design objects. I think it was also the first time that I saw the hair braid as a like sort of floating signifier because it was part of the floor. So yeah. it became a floor design. And that to me um, was so uh, incredible. You know, I'm still obsessed with them and someday I will have a house and we will floor it with little flooring. But I think that that aspect is what made 
it drew me right back to that space when I saw your piece in textures because there was something so familiar, but all of a sudden it was raised up um, and something I could enter rather than something that I was treading on. So it had a very different daylights to me. So yeah, but thank you for sharing that. Well, we're referring to this um, incredible residency and project. Maybe Nonsi, now's a good time to pull up some images of two or three recent installations so that so that the audience can see kind of the through thread, like what kinds of elements. So if you just wanna walk through a couple of your recent projects and then we'll circle back around to, to textures. Sure, I can definitely do that. And I will talk about um, a recent uh, installation, which, uses some of the motifs that Kijo is talking about, uh, the braided patterns that originated from floor tiles and uh, um, are based on these tiling modules, um, but uh, were not on the floor this time, but started to come around uh, different surfaces. I'm really interested in um, surface design. Um, I guess sometimes I'm running away from thinking about the wall of the gallery. You know, uh, you were talking about this um, uh, earlier, Joseph, where do I present the work? Sometimes, you know, because I was a painter before coming towards uh, learning about design, and I started to kind of rebel against the idea of a framed piece that, that something has to have a finite space, has to be hung a particular height on the wall. Why can't the work take up the whole wall? Why can't we be mapping the space with the work? Why does the work so obviously have to be held by the, the space? And where could the work creep? Um, and could people stand on it or stand um, in front of it and, and it immerse them or it encase them and things like that. Just the way braiding does, braiding comes ac across the surface of the body. It interacts with the body in so many different ways, but you can also find it uh, on the floor, lying on the floor somewhere. And I really have been inspired by, by this, um, how he as a visual object lives. And so this uh, piece was a commission from an art space in DC called Stable. And it was my first uh, kind of um, uh, outdoor installation. I didn't really understand what that meant, but I knew that this was part of what I, what I was uh, wanting to move towards with my work that again, we're not now inside the gallery. We're not bound by this uh, supposed white cube um, space, but we, that, that this work goes onto the street level. And this work starts to attend to surface. Um, and this work um, can be found by its audience. The audience doesn't have to um, know about the art space, know about the program. You know, I, I think uh, that there are, uh, are ways to work where we don't have to reinforce the kind of uh, bounding boxes that we put art in that kind of uh, to legitimize our um, our work that is within the space under this uh, uh, title, this heading, this name, and therefore it's something to come and see. I, th I think it's really wonderful to put things out on the street. And it's one of my motivations for learning about design because I thought if I can learn design tools, I can think at a um, flyer scale and a billboard scale and people can come uh, upon the work you know, as they're just moving around. Um, but this piece was important because it was, um, also a first time where I started to really think about language from home and to think about ways to translate my experience as an immigrant really directly as a Zimbabwean woman coming and living in America. And the title of this piece is Kudurunura, which means to undo, you know, before I was thinking about, you know, building the work, braiding the work, and, and I'm at a place where I'm thinking a lot about the unraveling, the taking apart, the, the rediscovery, the kind of remaking, you know, taking apart to then remake again, but also the, the kind of intimate, intimate relationship you need to have with someone to, put, to allow them to do you undo your hair. So I'm also thinking about um, who this work can be translated by, that there's certain levels of reading that people in different communities have and differently this work for me, even if I'm not in Zimbabwe, it's really speaking to people uh, from home who speak this language, um, who speak languages that are approximate, but that there's still a visual language that a wider black community can understand and other communities can also appreciate. I mean, so the work continues to build off these modules, thinking about braiding as something that's a repetitive practice. Um, it's the same kind of pattern over and over again. Um, to make the, the, the braids and um, you can get the, the same hairstyle over and over again as well. I we think about repetition, the meaning of repetition and using it to reinforce certain ideas. Um, 
and yeah, just my my favorite parts about this work are the kind of trailing and unraveling ends. I feel like they really accentuate something. Uh, sometimes we think, oh, that's the untidiest part of the hair. The hair is coming undone. And I think this is kind of the really the, the, the part that I'm really leaning into more and more these days. Um, okay, I have to click, not do the arrow down. Um, this piece, I think I'll, I'll show uh, this one with its process and, and the video. Um, and then we can move on to something else. But this is connected uh, to the, the piece I showed before. The, 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 I, I talked about the title, but the language that is being presented, because most of us on the call probably don't speak Shana. Um, the, the, the language here says Kusina Mai from the first um, mural on the box. And then this one here uh, says Hakuyendui. These uh, two murals are one piece, but one is in DC, and this one is back home in Harare, Zimbabwe. Um, and I could not go home to produce this work, um, so I communicated with Mural to fabricate the work. The beautiful thing about working with Mural, something that is a simple technique that can be repeated, is that it can be shared. It is something that people can learn, that people can participate in. I'm really interested in that aspect of the work that these modules can build that that can be given to someone else to continue to manipulate and make something of their own or to follow a, an instruction so i, I gave, gave some instructions there was so much measuring there was so much testing um and i really thought about this uh thing this idea kusina mai hakuyendui it means you don't go where you don't have kin you don't go where you don't have family and it's a warning uh, to people about leaving home. But when I um, think about this, I also think about the reality of if you do need to leave home, how do you make sure that you can make the next space home by developing a community, by, by leaning into the Black technology of community building as a resilience process. Uh, so this, for me, this uh, always carries through the work, collaborating with people, sharing with people, supporting people. Um, and yeah, uh, uh, kind of, I love that with this piece, I was really able to, to enact that for the production, not just, um, you know, in people seeing the work or um, benefiting from, from, yeah, from looking at the work and, and, and other respects, but really supporting a team of really amazing artists, supporting an art space that I am really connected to one of my amazing colleagues uh, at my Kam Zengerere, um, started this art space called Animal Farm. Um, in Harare, which is a residency for artists and has its own has its own actual farm. He thinks about sustainability and so really connecting uh, in that way it was beautiful. But um, I'll play this process video and then we can take the conversation to another direction. And while this plays, I'm going to turn off my camera just to see if that helps with streaming.
Um, oh, how do I come back? I'm just trying to find my cursor. Um, so we really spent months planning, uh, you know, me sending files, them cutting stencils with paper, them trying uh, working with a laser cutter, working with different scales, measuring the wall, all of these different things. So many text messages and um, yeah, it was just a, a really wonderful um, process. And so moving from the floor tiles to the system of working with um, cut stencils, with spray paint and working on walls, you know, in spaces that I can't access. I think, I think yeah, this has been a really wonderful um, trajectory of thinking through how to make uh, where my hand is when I'm making. In a way, I think my art and design practice is also like a hair salon where um, I, I'm i like the salon auntie, the woman that runs the place. And then there's younger, you know, uh, assistants who are able to like um, finish off some of the work or start the work and I come and check and all of these things. And it's a really beautiful way to work, kind of releasing some of the um, some of the craft to other people, like giving agency to other people, and allowing them to enter into the work and participate. I think I might uh, move on to questions about audience um, because I all I can think about is as this manifests in DC and then it manifests, uh, you know, here in Harare. Um, how do you not see? How do you even decide on an audience? Like, who do you try to reach? Because like you said, we don't all speak Shona, so we can't all necessarily read the text in that way. How do you think about audiences? Because then I have a follow-up question for Kijo about how she thinks about audiences too. Um, I think that um, it is not important to always understand everything, first of all. So the question of language for me, we're always working with different abilities to translate and to decipher so I, I don't feel that I if I'm making work I just put up a piece here in Berlin with sh some Shona text and actually the the, the singer in this uh, last piece the musician Tanya Ratsatoing will help me kind of think about what to write for this next um, what the language for this next piece would be and so but if I answer more directly about audience I'm my own audience I'm making work for myself first I, I make my work very selfishly because I need to. There's questions that I have that I want to answer. But I, for me, it's a, a good position because I know that if I have the question, someone else has the question, you know? I'm not really that much of a genius <laughs> that I can have so many original concerns. I'm not the first black woman to be an immigrant. My mother was an immigrant. My mother studied in Germany in the sixties. You know, I'm, I'm following a pattern. I'm trying to answer questions that people might have had or questions that people left. Um, and I'm hoping that the questions that I'm asking are going to be a prompt to other people. I'm hoping that the answers that I'm finding for myself are going to be content for other people. And so, you know, things that I've done from publishing to building websites like readingzimbabwe.com, they're very selfish. I didn't know enough about Zimbabwean authors. I needed to make a repository for my own self-study. But it's, a, it's an act of generosity, understanding that your concerns are other people's concerns that fulfilling that concern that you have, fulfilling my desire to make things that are beautiful and hold my attention. You know, especially during the pandemic, I realized I needed to start making work and pushing it out because people needed something that was kind of wholesome and really, you know, you know, just like something really seductive to preoccupy them when things were so like, you know, beauty is so functional and so, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm my primary audience, but because I know that I'm not the only one who is tuned into these kind of ideas and whose eye leans towards that or whose mind leans towards that. Um, and with the legibility issue, if someone can only appreciate the pattern, that's great. You know, if someone can see its letter forms, that's great. Maybe they're going to go and try to translate, what does Kusina Mai mean? And then you, you grow. And uh, maybe somebody knows Shana, but then they can't figure out why is this thing that says Kusina Mai in DC? And then they have a conversation with someone and then think about it. Someone Harari is saying, why is it saying how Kuyendui? You know? Um, yeah, I think all, um, and somebody that isn't even interested, that's also valid. So I'm making my work for, for myself first and hoping that other people will connect at different moments, but first I need to fulfill this. I think it's a valid pursuit. 
I really think that's a, an appealing concept that I, I actually don't find it selfish. I think it can be synergistic that when you are discovering the things that you need for yourself, that it that's going to have ripple effects for the people who have parallel questions. Um, so Kicho, this actually brings me to a question I had for you, which was, you know, on this topic of how do we reach specific audiences or think about legibility for audiences, um, we have to address audiences and perspectives that have been underserved or, or have been missing from kind of main narratives. So I know you are very committed to unearthing silenced narratives um, in your work, both within the museum, but also without. So how does that manifest? How, how can we translate what an artist designer does to what an, an art historian or curator does? How, how can you pursue that kind of line of inquiry? Well, I'll say that first and foremost, it's validating the kind of serendipitous responses that Nancy is bringing to the fore, right? That way in which someone, if, if they are in an art museum, it can seem like hmm, the knowledge is boxed. It is literally on a box in a label on a wall. And that's supposed to be what you need to know about that work to move on, right? And so as um, early in my uh, training as a museum educator, I learned that on average, an adult, if they plant their feet in front of an artwork, spend an average of 17 seconds in front of it and not actually looking at the work, but reading the text, right? And so I'm always interested in what is in between that text and the work. What is what feels so validating about being able to read that snippet and walk away and what is so dangerous about just standing in, in the work yourself and determining what it is that, um, that that work is saying to you. So I think in many ways, museums are set up to um, pose artworks as always giving, as only generous, as, as at, for pe setting up people to have expectations that everything they need to know is right at the surface. And so I think that what is really important is to point to the ways in which the discovery of a, a certain color that you saw in an artwork three galleries ago, while might, might not be related geographically because it's related in you, that is a valid relation, right? And so I think that for me, it is through the work as a museum educator in which we sit together and I just ask people what they see and why they see it. And we are allowed, and then we build a kind of a universe of interpretation in front of that work. Um, and so, but it can be complicated inside of museums because they are structured such that, and because we do want people to also feel that they can gain um, a specific kind of knowledge. People do also feel validated by being able to come back to their artwork and say, oh, I know these particular facts. Yeah. But I think that my, like Nancy, my own scholarship and the way that I curate is also really selfish. So um, in my training as an art historian, you know, for during survey classes, there would be, you know, Black People Week. And perhaps, you know, uh, LGBTQ, IA week, and they would all be contained and the rest would be, here's what white men were making and doing, and here's why it's important. And even in Black Person Week, it would be, well, here's how these Black artists are actually looking at these European men and inheriting from them. So I'm looking at the in-between um, 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 spaces and, and trying to validate that. Um, and so I guess in practical terms, I guess I can show um, a couple of things. So currently uh, I am curating a show called uh, Currents and Constellations. Let me share my screen. Uh -oh. There we are. So it's called um, Black Art in Focus. And so it will take place in the Cleveland Museums of Art Focus Gallery, which is um, a smaller gallery on the first floor. So what I was not interested in was doing a survey in which you could walk in and say, here is all of the breadth of Black art that was ever created, and now I know. Instead, it is, here are some propositions of, of um, ways of thinking that groupings of black artists over time are sort of responding to. And again, it's also very selfish because a lot of the um, emerging and newer artists that I will be featuring, I know from Yale. So it's this kind of way in which we sort of work within the circles that we have. I'm, I'm 
working to answer some questions for myself, but also provoke new ones. Um, and so what I will show you is, for instance, and this is something that connects really deeply, I think, to Nazi's work, that idea of mapping space, and not only mapping space, but carving and controlling space. So um, in this, uh, there will be a section that's dealing with sort of Black artists who are really thinking about how Black folks exist in space, how they move through space, and then creating visual language to talk about it. So for instance, in the early earliest work um, by Richard Hunt from 1960. It's called uh, Forms Carried Aloft. And it goes, rises to this really sharp point that you have to navigate around. And he was really invested in moving bodies around and through space. And that's how he felt empowered in welding, even though it's so slim. Then we have Night Coming Tenderly Black by Dawu Bey, which was a photograph taken um, in Cleveland. He did a project in which he was uh, exploring the Underground Railroad, right? So thinking about these murky spaces where fugitive liberation can occur. And then Torquase Dyson in this shaped canvas, A Whisper in the Blue, Bird and Lava, she is exploring um, the transit of Black people during Red Summer. So the ways in which the waterways of America became really deathly to Black people in the summers of, um, of 1920 as uh, redlining impacted the way that Black people were allowed to move through space, but also releasing those, um, those uh, shapes from that context such that they can become an aesthetic device for investigating that kind of depth of, of trauma in really particular ways. And so there's a way in which what gets validated here is this sense of mystery, which is held still in these, in these objects. They are not objects that just hand over their meaning, their objects that make demands of us. And that's what I think is the comportment that I'm trying to elevate, that everything is making demands, including we make demands of each other in our interactions. And it is our, our role to sort of validate um, that demand in, in a particular way. And that comfort isn't necessarily the ultimate goal. It's how do we sit with that? How do we, and how do we sit with it with joy? Because it can be generative to not know. Um, so yeah, I don't want to take up too much time, but I'll just give a couple more. So there's one also in thinking about how uh, in the history of portraiture, women and Black women don't appear as much across the history of, of, of portraiture, but when they do, it is, it is normally like women appear as objects ready for consumption. And so there is um, a way in which the turning the figure away, this idea of refusal um, is really impactful. It connects to me to the culture of dissemblance, the way that black women can perform in a particular way as a mode of protection while there are incredible things happening beneath and behind. But it also goes to the ways in which um, uh, that refusal exists in the archive. We think only of um, archival erasures, but we don't think of archival occlusions. We don't think of the protective quality of withholding. And so this challenges the notion that we need to find out the names, addresses, you know, um, biological details of every single person that is in the archive. In some ways, that protective mode is also working there and it's up to us to decide where we're gonna fall on one side or the other. Um, and finally, because like Nancy said, I don't believe in keeping things boxed in. So there will be some works in the focus gallery, but I'm also doing four permanent gallery interventions. So into our American portrait gallery, we have this Charles Wilson Peel and workshop, George Washington at the Battle of Princeton, which is a highlight of the collection. People visit it all the time. Um, and we will be bringing into context Titus Gaffar's Shadows of Liberty, which is a reproduction of John Fayette's um, portrait of Washington that you see in the center, but in which he has uh, taken the names of all of George Washington's slaves painted them onto canvas, and then adhered them to the surface of the uh, canvas with rusted nails. So as a bid toward the West African and Kisi and Kondi figure, so that who gets the power to speak, right? So yes, yeah, so, but they will be hanging right next to each other, which for our audiences will be a very new experience. How, when you get the critique and the sort of shining beacon at the same time, but to my mind, that's how we have to understand this human. 
That's how we have to, if we're ever going to approach a way in which we can deeply contextualize our history, we have to hold these things together and be able to stand the ways in which um, uh, uh, there is no all good um, um, to be had and that that has to be okay. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the ways in which I think about weaving these, these, these gaps together, but also living inside the gap. I, 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 I really want to emphasize how important it is that to sometimes allow the loss to be and adjust ourselves to that because so much troubles happens because we're trying to avoid loss in some way or another. Totally. <laughs> well, I just want to jump in and say, I, um, I love this preoccupation with the gap. I think it's so important. The gap is also something to be read. Why is something not there? Yes. And that, that is content. Um, and also just in terms of making images, negative space is so important in making the shape of what we focus on. And even with the work that I'm doing, the, the, the patterns become the patterns because of the space, because of dealing with the kind of frequency of the gap and, and, mm -hmm. and also with it allows for things to hold together or allows for things to fall apart. And so I really love um, yeah, what you're doing in your work, what you've been doing in your work for so long. And I, it's wonderful to see the manifestation in this curatorial project. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nancy. Yeah, no, I think that, you know, but I'm also indebted, right? I'm indebted to artists like you. Like I think about your work while I am curating these shows. I think about um, artists who are sort of holding still that moment of constant becoming and undoing and unbecoming, right? So these ways in which this is my own those dive into physics, but the ways in which we are always in the process of becoming is what gets held still in those little tendrils, those ends, you know, and also, but also brings me back to that history of black women and the culture of dissemblance, because I think about the ways in which my edges are never meant to show, the ways in which I have to stop myself from retwisting when my strands start to escape because of as a way of rejecting, right, the notion that neatness means goodness or that somehow my strands escaping isn't neat. So yeah, there yeah. are these ways in which both in the, in the design, in the practical terms, but also in its essence, like your work inspires and allows me to do this work. It's artists that, that help to validate that living in the gap because history is not so into that. <laughs> I love that you bring up that point because I started to think about this, um, you know, technically when a hair mm -hmm. style is produced, mm -hmm. it becomes old. It starts to, it starts the process of unraveling itself the moment you have finished mm -hmm. the hairstyle. Once the hairstyle is complete, it's, it's just going through the motions of undoing itself. Yes. And um, you decide the moment where you totally take it out and then refresh and I think this is a reality, this uh, kind of within the space of the museum and the art gallery, this tendency to preserve, to hold still, to create uh, this uh, level of stasis, to make things stable um, is not a reality in, in our lives. Our bodies do not even do this. Not so. at all. And it made me think specifically of your, um, your Kasamats project. So that I think that um, Joseph did, because it was this way of, this, the way that we're all always subject to that process of, of becoming, um, yeah. I'm, I'm really glad you brought up Casamance. So uh, for those who haven't visited Textures yet, that's the, the name of, of the site-specific installation that uh, Nonsi was able to construct with our installation team, actually in a very similar way to the project in Harare, it was all virtual and WhatsApp and, you know. <laughs> um, so Nancy, can you walk through a little bit of the process of that and, um, I'm just even curious when you first heard of textures in this exhibition project, how you thought it might resonate with your practice or when you first held the catalog and you got to see who else was in the show. It's been so interesting doing a curatorial project in COVID times with people not being able to physically travel. So we're thinking, how can we disseminate it? And I'm just kind of curious how it came across you know, uh, to, to the artist on the other side of the of, of my email inbox. Yeah, um, so I actually had promised myself I would not do another show that was about black hair 
ever again. And then you uh, emailed me and I was first like, no, I will not participate. But I realized it was not, it wasn't important for me to participate because of how my work fitted into the theme. It was important for me to participate because of whom my work was going to be in conversation with and what that, what the works, the juxtaposition, the kind of moving through, through the work and understanding the way people were expressing things and not that the show is just about black hair, like hair itself that sits on your head or hairdressing. It was about the whole vocabulary of tools, the history of the tools that black people have used to tend to care, to groom and the, the politics around that, the, the kind of genius and inventiveness around that. Um, you know, there's a whole library of combs and I have a whole collection of combs myself that I started um, when I was in graduate school. I, I really love this very, very, very deep uh, research uh, into kind of a holistic, a, re a really holistic look at what not just hair means, what community means, what uh, invention means, what design means, what uh, hair as surface design means, uh, what, you know, the, kind of the political implications are, but not just from a kind of flattened black hair politics. There's this artists from so many different backgrounds really key to the specificity of how hair has been used to police our bodies, specifically within uh, different histories, um, really uh, thinking about oppressive, you know, oppression and how it operates within particular contexts and at different moments in time. But it's also not that, it's also an amazing celebration of such brilliant minds um, and presented in such a phenomenal way. And I think that just doing justice to the, the voices that have been making this work, um, the objects that they have made uh, is just really, yeah, it just was it's a really phenomenal project in itself. It's doing so many different things, and I really respected that. Well, thank you. No, I mean, it, it wouldn't be what it was without, um, again, kind of like Hija, the artists who inspire us to even think through these questions and to sit and wrestle. Um, so would you would you mind pulling up a couple of, of images of the installation? Um, for those who haven't oh. seen, it's actually in the museum lobby, kind of a, a site-specific site installation on, on the platform of the stairs as you walk up into the main gallery. So just walk us, uh, you know, how, how can we even engage with installations that aren't legible as text? Because this one doesn't have words in it, right? It's just the braid uh, patterns. How, how, what should we do well, as, we, a, as we see it? You know? This is actually, I'm surprised you didn't notice, uh, uh, Joseph, because this mural actually says Kasamats. <laughs> it's actually the name of what it is. Uh, this uh, Kasamats is the name of a braided hairstyle, which is uh, uh, produced by many West African braiders in spaces like Harlem or in Detroit. Or I'm not sure if people are using this term for, it, for the style of braids in London, but and they don't use it in Harare, but it's really like in the US, you see on the braiders business cards on the awnings, Kasamans, and it means these very thick, long box braids. Um, but in here, you see on the right hand, on the left hand side, this big uh, kind of snaking C, and then the, like just underneath the top of it is the A, then there's an S at the bottom, and then there's a very elaborate A in the middle. There's a very uh, kind of echoing M and another A, and then an the uh, S S N E, oh, oh, yeah, and so for me this was kind of writing the name across the space. Also, Casamance is a is a location in Senegal, which is really lush, you know, and is kind of also kind of playing with that the idea of the braids and the idea of the space, and um, I kind of wanted to point to the idea of location and the presence of West African braiders. Uh, within the space of America doing this very important work of grooming and producing uh, beauty uh, for, you know, for people like me. Um, but this project was also really uh, exciting because I like the idea of mapping the space itself, like I said before, and having to tend to a space which is not flat, that kind of um, has all these different edges. I think a lot about my, the amount of time I spend in the air flying between Harare, uh, New York, maybe London, maybe Richmond, Virginia, maybe Berlin, and how Black African women are doing this all the time. When you're in the braiding salon, you hear the women from Guinea talking about 
who went home and who's going home? Can you please take this? You know, the Senegalese women saying, oh, I went home for the baby shower. I'm going to play the video of the baby shower, you know, next Saturday come. You know, everyone's always talking about travel. We see the, the world from a, a, kind of another perspective very often. And I loved this platform being able to do something that was um, kind of almost again on the floor, something that came up the kind of winding around the corners and that this uh, area that I got to um, design with and, and play with is also a portal, is an entryway into, into another space. So it was important for me to kind of, to technically kind of use the language, not just the, the word, Kasamans, the, the visual vocabulary of the braiding and kind of, and work in this way. Um, but, you know, this was the design file, like it was so much measuring and um, I don't have a very technical mathematical brain, but this work uh, relies on it. It totally falls apart if things are not aligned properly, <clears throat> if things aren't the same size, if things aren't touching, if something's at an angle, it, it, it's, it falls apart unless for the image I want those breakages. Sometimes I want those breakages, but for this one, because I wasn't going to be there to, to make the decisions about breaking it in the moment, which I like to do to add those idiosyncratic elements, just like coming at the end of the hairstyle and neatening it up. You know, when you're braiding in tandem with other people, somebody starts, somebody does the length, somebody comes and does the end. I like to, to be that person that finishes it off, but I didn't have the luxury. And so I had to bake some of those idiosyncratic parts into the file and then really rely on the mapping, things mapping tightly um, to kind of make the work sing. But, but it was really exciting to think about all, all these facets. And this is a video that Joseph, um, uh, made uh, of the space and it's just really exciting to see the scale and the fact that, that the plan worked. <laughs> um, I'm just really proud of, of this uh, piece and I, I learned so much about a, a very closed system that I have with these letter forms. I mean I've really designed um, a series of letter forms from A to Z, eight different versions of these letter forms that are kind of fixed. But when I work with them in an installation, that's the moment to play and adjust them. It's like figuring out another kind of accent that each uh, letter form can have, like the, like an, an accent that different accents you hear in a salon, or thinking about when you are wearing your hair and then um, braids are kind of twisting and kind of tan tangling around each other, or knotting around each other, or braids are braiding are braided uh, together again. I really love those uh, moments. And then technically it really is made up of even more pieces than what I planned because of the limitations of the tools and the technology, which I always find exciting to work with the tools, to think about what the tools can handle. Um, and then to also trust in the technical team to, to produce. And all of this process, I really like insist if I'm not there, I need the photos. And when I'm there, I, I take so many images of the process because for me, it's about the doing. I love the end result, but it's really about the, the doing and the making. And, and maybe last thing I'll say about the process and the materials, this is all cut vinyl. And so it is um, a material where, uh, a plastic material that a, a, a vinyl cutter with a needle has to draw and cut every single shape. And then somebody has to come and take out the, the negative space, the stuff I don't want people to see on the wall. And then they take those sheets, they peel off the back. It leaves an adhesive on the back and you stick, it's like humongous stickers that have been cut in an elaborate design that you kind of piece and tile together. And what I love about the work is once the show ends, it all just has to be peeled down. Just like hair braiding, you do it on the head and for you to get another uh, you know, hairstyle, you have to take what you had off. You can't, I mean, if, you, if it was a wig, yes, you could lift it off and then put it there and bring it back. But this is not it, you know, you have to enjoy the work for when it's up and then it totally gets destroyed. And I wish I was there to come and undo it because it also is another kind of beauty to see the parts unraveling and making something new by starting to delete and, and take out uh, certain elements. I think this is something I'm going to be exploring in the future, like how do I record some of the building and making? How do I record some of the taking down um, that this can become like work itself? Thank you so much, Nancy. I think it just attests to the need for patience and uh, attentiveness. And I will certainly be revisiting soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
I, no, but it's a, legi- it's a legibility thing. It's a legibility thing. And I didn't want to tell you this is what the, the work is doing because the, the work is also just attending to the space, you know? And I think that for me, the success of this piece, what I won from this piece was a moment to work in this very three-dimensional way. I mean, my goal is to like map a whole room, floor to ceiling in braids, you know? I think I will have a headache in the room. Everyone have a headache because of the pattern. Well, that's going to be in Kijo's house, right? That's what she said. <laughs> exactly. But so, exactly. so you, got, you got me a little bit closer. For me, that I was successful. And whether you can read or someone can read is not so important. I appreciate that. That's not the, that's not the main meaning of the, of the project. Right. So I, I can't believe it. We were we've almost used up our hour. Um, if anyone did have any kind of final questions, please do drop them in the chat. Um, I'll just read out a couple of comments that have been made, and then I don't know if Kijo or Nonsi have questions or, or responses for each other, um, but lots of uh, people saying, like, this is on point, this is really helpful, you know, very uh, brilliant curatorial strategies, and, uh, uh, and Nonsi, you've responded mm-hmm. to Zara's comment, thinking about Kazamans as, as a separatist region, and, and yet your practice of claiming space and care, um, and Ladosha, right, who's a, one of our good friends of, of textures has said as a cosmetologist uh, the parallels are simply beautiful and so full of respect for afro air afro hair art the art of it its complexities and those who braid it and style it it, it definitely made me think of our um, digital green book project where we've interviewed 10 area barbers um, and, and salon owners and we have a braiding salon as one of them and that kind of meditative quality is one of the things that she talks about in, in her interview so it's just so interesting to see all these threads always come together in such synergistic ways. Cannot wait for um, to go see Key Joe's project up at Cleveland. So any of you who are in the, the region, visiting that museum is free. You know, it's a free admission to that gallery and space. So I do encourage you to go see it. Um, I'm gonna pull up a couple of announcements, uh, but any kind of closing thoughts, Nonsi and or Key Joe? Nancy, I just want to ask, do you know Nafis White? Oh, yes, I do. Because there has, there's like some collaboration I mean, that I mean, needs to happen there. Yes, <laughs> okay. Pandemic, I, I wrote to her I was, I, on Instagram. I was like, oh, uh, we need to have a sit down. We need to have a serious sit down because the, the connections in the work, uh, you know, are there. But her preoccupation with the, with the actual technical braiding and what she can do and how she builds and just like so mesmerizing and also reminds me of um, uh, Zenobia Bailey's work, you know, this attention, yes. to real technical and the labor and how that is also, you know, uh, important in making beauty. Sometimes I, I'm making digital work and it seems so easy just to output it, you know, some machine is doing it and I really, uh, really appreciate uh, this attention to kind of labor and, and touching the thing the whole way through and those those uh, small moments, and, and you do that when you're braiding. But I, I wanted to say that um, the dosha as a hairdresser also teaches and also publishes. And I think, again, back to the first project we mentioned um, about recess and Ruka, that the space of the hairdressing salon, like the space of the home, is so multifaceted as a space for teaching, sharing, tending, caring, making beauty, healing. And um, yeah, I think that uh, also Kijo, what you're saying about your exhibition, you're kind of proposing that, that that the exhibition can do these things, that the exhibition space, the museum space can be doing all of these things using the work of the artists, the voices of the artists, the motivations of the artists, and you're kind of thinking about the constellations and the groupings that we can get all of that, all of those wonderful qualities just from, from entering into there. Yeah, and thank you all. I. I uh... You know, we, we have a piece uh, by Nafis in, in textures and it's, <laughs> you can't miss it. And, and that's what I think is so exciting about um, the exhibition, but also the publication, just kind of bringing all these voices and, and visual elements in one space. And we can't wait to see what spins out of it. Textures is by no means like the be all end all, you know, on this subject. It is very much a, a launching point for future conversations, curatorial projects um, and collaborations. So um, I just, uh, I have put up on the screen, uh, feel free to take a screenshot. These are some of the upcoming events related to textures. They're all in the, the, the next semester. This is the last one for 2021. And, um, 
And then here are um, a couple of announcements based on uh, the things Kijo was talking about, the exhibition um, she was referring to, which opens in February, and then a really compelling uh, publication that will be coming out as well um, that uh, Kijo has helped organize called Perceptual Drift. So there are uh, further conversations to be had. And um, obviously, please follow Nancy on Instagram or all of her websites and social. <laughs> They're fine if they don't follow me. <laughs> so you can see what the next projects are and which continent she'll be working on next. No, definitely. Yeah, no, follow, follow for that. There's going to be some exciting um, things yeah, coming up in the future. I just want to thank you both for joining this afternoon. You are both so generous with your, your work and your words and your thoughts. And I, I just feel so privileged to have worked with you, Nancy, on this and then to have Kijo in the region as a colleague. You know, So I thank you all for making the time and space. And uh, a big thank you to everyone who's joined us this afternoon or who is watching it on the later recording. Um, look forward to seeing you all at the next art event and conversation to keep the dialogue going. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joseph. Thanks, Kijo. Thanks, Nancy. <laughs> and thank you to all the thank yous in the chat. <laughs> Have a good afternoon, everyone.